welcome you all to this live YouTube event organized by Vishwaniketan International Peace Center here in Sri Lanka via its YouTube channel. It is indeed auspicious to launch this live program by streaming a Dhamma talk by most venerable Bhante Mahinda Tero, a Kalyana Mitha of Vishwaniketan in the true sense of the word. Venerable Mahinda was born in Malaysia, was ordained in 1976 as a Buddhist monk under the tutelage of the late Venerable Dr. K. Sri Dhamma Nanda Nayaka Tero. Bhante Mahinda was ordained in 1976. After his ordination, he undertook a Buddhist studies program at the Paramadhamma Chetiya Buddhist Institute in Sri Lanka from 1977 to 1982. He was trained in meditation by several well-known masters in Sri Lanka, India, Myanmar, and Thailand, and inspired by Mahayana masters from China, Taiwan, Korea, and Japan, as well as by Vajrayana masters from Tibet, Nepal, Bhutan, and India. Bhante Mahinda has taught mindfulness and metta meditation for more than 30 years in 20 countries. Currently, Bhante Mahinda is the abbot of the Aloka Meditation Center in Australia, founder, spiritual director of the Australian Buddhist Mission, Buddhist chaplain to the University of Technology, Sydney, trustee of the University Buddhist Education Foundation, and training committee member and training course presenter of the Australian Association of Buddhist Counselors and Psychotherapists. He is also the founder and spiritual director of the Aloka Foundation, Malaysia, religious patron of the Young Buddhist Association of Malaysia, religious advisor to the Buddhist Missionary Society Malaysia, and a number of other Buddhist organizations in East and West in West Malaysia and Singapore. With this brief introduction on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the ATR Ratna Charitable Trust, I respect, uh, respectfully invite most venerable Bhante Mahinda to deliver this maiden Dhamma talk on the theme beyond life and death through mindfulness. To you, Bhante Mahinda. Thank you. Suki, or to, to all of you. <laughs> the subject for today is beyond birth and death, true mindfulness. In order to go beyond the samsaric cycle of birth and death, in a quick and in a swift manner, we need to understand two important aspects of the teachings of the Buddha. They are one, the cultivation of the four foundations of mindfulness, and two, the understanding of the law of dependent origination or paticca samuppada. Those who have not come into contact with such teachings cannot imagine how old age, sickness, death can be overcome in this very lifetime, or at least the seeds of final liberation that could be planted in this lifetime. <clears throat> the Mahasatipatthana Sutta is generally 
regarded as the most important sutta in the Pali Tripitaka. In the opening verse of the Maha Satipatthana Sutta, the discourse on the development of mindfulness, the Buddha said, Ekayano ayang bikwe maggo satthanang visuddhya soka paridavanang samatikamaya dukkha domanasanang attangamaya nyayasa adigamaya nibbanasa sachikriyaya yadidang jattaro satipatthana Addressing the monks, the Buddha said, O monks, this is the one and only path for the purification of beings. Purification of beings here means the purification of one's mind. Purification from the tendencies of lobe, dosa, moha, greed, hatred, and delusion. And for the overcoming of sorrow and lamentation, for the cessation of mental and physical stress and for the attainment of higher knowledges. And finally, for the realization of Nibbana, namely through the four foundations of mindfulness. In other words, it is through the cultivation of the four foundations of mindfulness that we will be able to accomplish all the five functions. Now let us first consider there are these four foundations of mindfulness. They are mindfulness on the body, mindfulness on feelings, mindfulness on the mind or the state of mind, and mindfulness on Dhamma. The first foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness on the body. There are six different aspects in a mindfulness on the body. First aspect is anapanasati, mindfulness on breathing in and out. Then you have mindfulness on the four body postures the clear comprehension of activities of the body. That means whatever actions that the body performs. Then there's also the four elements, the earth, water, fire, wind element. Patavi, apo, tejo, vayu. Then there's the 32 parts of the body that is the loathsomeness or the repulsiveness of this body. And the sixth one is the nine symmetry contemplation. That is the different stages of the composition of this body. Actually, we only need to focus on the first aspect of mindfulness in the body. That is anapanasati. And all the other five aspects are supporting practice. It is to support our practice of anapanasati so that our mind don't get distracted. Of course, for those who have strong attachment, desire, lustful desire, then the recommendation would be to contemplate on the 32 parts of body and to contemplate on the loathsomeness or the repulsiveness of this body that will help the mind to become less attached to form. And uh, then <clears throat> furthermore, when we cultivate mindfulness on anapanasati, we will naturally develop mindfulness on feelings, mind or mental states, and the Dhamma. All the four foundations of mindfulness, 
will be covered through the practice of Samatha Vipassana meditation. In other words, the practice of Samatha Vipassana actually involves the cultivation of the four foundations of mindfulness. It can also be called Satipatthana or mindfulness meditation. So what is Samatha Vipassana meditation? Samatha refers to calmness or tranquility. And Vipassana refers to wisdom, insights. The word Vipassana, we is a prefix, prefix, but Pali that uh, implies special. And Vipassati, Pasana, Pasati is actually to see, to see, to train the mind to see in a special way. And what is this special way? It is to see the true nature of things in terms of anicca, dukkha, anatta. Anicca is impermanence. Dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. And anatta, non-self. So Vipassana is to train the mind to develop to see the true nature of things in terms of anicca, dukkha, anatta. They are not two different types of meditation. Although the manner in which these are being taught by certain masters tend to give the impression that they are different. We must remember the whole principle of Buddha's teaching, or the Buddha Dhamma, is based on causality. That is, all phenomena arise dependent on causes and condition. The formula is, it must mean sati idang hoti. It must mean asati idang na hoti. That is, when this arises, that arises. When this ceases, that ceases. So, when calmness and tranquility arise, wisdom and insight will naturally arise. One conditions the other. So as such, they are not two separate entities as if one is better than the other, as some Buddhist practitioners seem to think. The Buddha taught his disciples based on their different dispositions and temperaments. For some, he would encourage them to develop samatha before they practice the Vipassana, insight. For others, <clears throat> he would encourage them to practice, to develop insight before they develop their calmness. So it all depends on the disposition of each individual. The practice of Samatha Vipassana meditation through Anapanasati, or mindfulness on breathing in and breathing out, involves the cultivation of Samma Samadhi, or right concentration, which is mentioned in the Noble Eightfold Path. This consists, Samma Samadhi consists of Patama Dutya Tatya Tatuta Chatuta Jana, that is the first second, third, and the fourth jhana, or mental absorption. And we have to understand that there are different degrees or levels of samadhi. In the commentaries, they are classified, the different levels of uh, samadhi is classified as kanika samadhi, 
there is momentary concentration. Upachara samadhi, excess concentration. And there's apana, apana, a full, complete concentration. Now, what degree of concentration should we develop before moving on to the cultivation of insight? That will depend on each individual's disposition, how much he or she has developed in the past, whether in this lifetime or in some other past lives. I will now explain how these five jhanas factors arises and, uh, and how to develop the four jhanas. Now, when the five mental hindrances, the five mental hindrances are Kama Chanda, Vyapada, Tinamitta, Uddaja Kukucha, Vijikicha. Kama Chanda, a sensual desire. Now, when sensual desire arises, then our concentration goes off. Similarly, Vyapada, anger, aversion. When we have anger, aversion towards anyone, or even towards ourselves, or towards some phenomena, then concentration goes off. That's why it is called hindrance. Then the, another hindrance is Tena Middha. It's the sloth and torpor. It is the inertia of the mind, the laziness of the mind to apply on the object of meditation. Then, Udacha Kukucha, restlessness and worry. Here, restlessness can be conditioned by so many things. Our craving, our desire, anger, they can condition restlessness. But there are something which we may not realize so easily. These are some actions which we have done in the past, something which we have violated certain precepts or something which we should have done and we have not done. Some duties, some responsibilities or assignments. So when we have not done such thing, we will feel a sense of restlessness. Yeah. Then, <clears throat> And that's why the way how to overcome this is to forgiveness, to seek forgiveness. Yeah. Then the fifth <coughs> mental hindrance is vichikicca or doubts. Of course, the main doubt is of course the doubt with regards to Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Anyone who has this doubt to Buddha Dhamma Sangha, this uh, will be obscured. The mind has this kind of obscuration and cannot develop the mind further. Yeah. Now, when these five mental hindrances, that is, Kama Chanda, Vyapada, Tinamitta, Uddaja Kukucha, and Vichikicha. When these five mental hindrances are at least kept under control, then the five jhana, five jhana factors will arise. They are vitakka, vichara, piti, sukham, ikagata. Vitakka is the applied thought. When the instruction is to bring your attention to your breath, actually you are applying your thought. Bringing your attention to the breath, you apply your thought there. And then we tell you to keep your attention, to sustain your attention and breath. That is sustained thought. And we also tell you to keep your attention in one area so that your mind is not distracted and does not go here and there. So that is ekagata. Of course, 
it may not be just one point because it can be very stressful if you try to fix your attention on one point. So these three things that you do, apply application of thought, vitaka, which are sustained thought, and in one area, they are called the causal factors. You can cause them to happen. Then the two other factors, PET, come. they are resultant factors. That means you have no control over them. As a result of your applied thought, sustained thought, and one-pointedness, then piety sukang will arise. Piety is a sense of rapture or joy. But in the early stages, it is more experienced in terms of a sense of enthusiasm, where your body begins to feel light. And, uh, but the most important thing, you start to feel and uh, your, your body becomes very upright and you don't feel like getting up from your meditation. And then when PET arises, it will condition sukang. Sukang is bliss or a sense of ease. <clears throat> there is what you call kaya sukang and chitta sukang. That is the ease that we experience at the physical, the body level. All the pains and aches which we have been experiencing during our meditation, when the mind enters in the first jhana, then all this pain and ease off, or it becomes totally under control. Then there is also chitta sukha, the thoughts, all sorts of distraction that the mind experiences and all these will begin to ease off and when these jhana factors arise. So when the five factors are pre present, we say that the mind has entered the first jhana. Yeah. And, and then we will make a breakthrough. The first jhana, with the first jhana or the first absorption, we make a breakthrough to all the discomfort the pain and the unpleasant sensation. Then when we develop the second jhana, we will experience more pleasant sensation. And in the third jhana, even the pleasant sensation, piti sukha, they become very subtle, very refined, and eventually fade away. And in the fourth jhana, the pleasant sensation will be gone. Even we may not be able to feel our breathing and even the body we don't feel. Then we will experience a sense of equanimity, neither pleasant nor unpleasant feeling. So this is how through Anapanasati, developing the jhanas, the four jhanas, we, it will naturally take us through the three kinds of feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Then, when we go through the four jhanas, we will also have developed mindfulness on the mind, the state of mind. We would become aware of the different levels, the different degrees of concentration. That's how when we develop, when the mind, when we look at the mind and observe mindfulness on the mind, mental state, then there'll be less and less thoughts and the mind becomes more and more empty. Yeah, Because at that stage, whatever mental states arises, Sometimes craving may arise. And as soon as you become aware, it will cease, it will fade away. In the same manner, when anger or aversion arises, if we're just aware, just the bare attention without creating other thoughts, then it will also fade away. 
So when the mind becomes more and more empty, and that is how it will lead us to the next foundation of mindfulness, that is with regards to the cultivation of the Dhamma, mindfulness on Dhamma. Yeah. Now, it is this mindfulness on Dhamma. The word Dhamma has very wide scope meaning. But with regards in the context of uh, the four foundation of mindfulness, Dhamma here refers to five aspects of Dharma. When we develop, as we develop these five aspects of Dharma, and that is where the practice of Vipassana comes to play. Yeah. What are the five aspects of Dharma? They are the five mental hindrances, five aggregates, six sense bases, seven factors of enlightenment, and the four noble truths. Now, I will explain briefly on these different aspects of Dharma. The first is with regards to the five mental hindrances, which I have mentioned. They are, they are called hindrances in the sense that they hinder, they block the progress of our concentration. They are Kama Chanda, Vyapada, Tinamitta, Udacha Kukucha, Vichikicha. That is sensual desires, anger, aversion, sloth and topper, restlessness, and doubts. These five mental hindrances, when we are able to check them through the cultivation of our mental faculties, there are five mental faculties. They are called Sadda, Virya, Sati, Samadhi, Panya. Sadda means faith, confidence. When we have faith, confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, then this faith will condition energy or effort, virya. And this virya, we direct our effort towards the cultivation of mindfulness, sati. Then when we develop, when mindfulness develops, then concentration will arise, samadhi. And when samadhi develops, then that will condition panya, wisdom to arise. So these five mental faculties, they are one conditioning the other. But when these five mental faculties are developed in a balanced manner, then we develop what we call mental power, the will. And that is how these five mental hindrances can be kept under control, not totally eradicated yet, but at least they are kept under control. As soon as they are kept under control, then the jhana factors will arise, vitaka, vichara, piti, sukham, ekagata. And when the jhana factors arise, that's how we develop first, second, third, fourth jhana. And after developing first, second, third, fourth jhana, our mind, we have trained the mind and the mind becomes more and more stable, not easily distracted. And that is how we will be able to observe the five aggregates. That's how we'll be able to understand and familiarize ourselves with the five aggregates. What are these five aggregates? They are the aggregates of form. Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, Vijnana. Rupa means form. 
this body is formed. Our eye and the visual object that we see, they are also formed. So in the same manner, our ear and the sound that we hear, they are all formed, they are all physical phenomena. So all through our six sense bases, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and the mind, there are, there are six the sense base, internal base, and there are the external sense objects. Yeah. So first we have to understand the first form, feeling our, there's pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant, unpleasant feelings. Yeah. Then, sanya, perception, our perception, how we cognize things. And uh, that's how we get memories. Yeah. We are able to recognize things and we create memories. It's all come from sanya. Then sanya, there is uh, <coughs> sankara. <coughs> Sankara, they are mental formation, right? mental formation. Our thoughts, the thoughts that we create, my, my, that's Sankara. And Vijnana, consciousness. These five factors, they are called the five aggregates. And how, how does these five aggregates arise? What is the nature of these five aggregates? The nature of these five aggregates, it is constantly in a state of flux. It arises actually through our six sense bases. When we see something or hear something and consciousness arises, our eye, ear consciousness arise. And as soon as the consciousness arise, there's contact. So when there's contact, then a thought arises. We cannot see, we cannot hear, we cannot smell, we cannot taste, we cannot feel. We don't. Thoughts. When the thoughts arises, then the impressions of the five aggregates arise. And that is how these five, what you call Dhamma, aspects of Dhamma, they are arranged in this particular order as we practice. When the five mental hindrances are kept under control, then the five jhana factors arises and that prepares our mind to familiarize with the five aggregates. And we observe these five aggregates, how they arise through the six sense bases. And that is how we'll be able to see the impermanent nature of these five aggregates, how they arise and cease. Yeah. And, uh, and that's where it leads us to the next one is the seven factors of enlightenment. Now, what are the seven factors of enlightenment? They are Sati, Dhamma Vichaya, Virya, Piti, Pasadi, Samadhi, Upeka. Seven factors of enlightenment. The first factor of enlightenment is mindfulness. And we have talked about mindfulness, the four foundations of mindfulness. In fact, the four foundation mindfulness is such that when we cultivate the first foundation, such as mindfulness on anapanasati, breathing in and breathing out, it will naturally lead us to become aware of our feelings. And when you observe the feelings, then naturally our mind becomes more sensitive. The feeling will fade away. Then whether pleasant, un pleasant or neither pleasant, unpleasant, all that will fade away. Then the mind becomes very sensitive to the state of mind. 
the thoughts that arises and mental states. Then, when the mind becomes more and more empty, then begins to see the Dharma. So this is how the, from the first factor of enlightenment, Sati, Sati will condition the second factor, which is Dhamma Vichaya, investigation of Dhamma. Investigation of Dhamma here refers to the investigation of Nama Rupa. And the Nama Rupa, Nama, the mental aspects or mental uh, process, and Rupa, the form. So in the in Vipassana training, Nama Rupa actually refers to the five aggregates. First is Rupa. Rupa is this form. Then Nama, all the other mental aspects, feeling, perception, mental formation, conscious, consciousness, they are grouped under Rupa. Nama. Nama Rupa. So, the first factor of enlightenment, sati, will naturally condition nama rupa. Second factor, which is dhamma vichaya. Dhamma vichaya, investigation of dhamma. Then when one investigates the dharma, one sees, experiences, how everything is of the nature to rise and cease, rising and falling. And that is where one begins to experience impermanence. And once, when we experience impermanence, a sense of bliss will arise. And our confidence will develop. The confidence that this is the truth. This is the way. And when that confidence, the sraddha develop, it will condition the third factor of enlightenment called virya. Virya is energy, effort. So this energy will arise and the mind will begin to experience a sense of strong energy. And that will pitch the mind to a higher level. Piti. Virya, when we have virya, we're conditioned a sense of joy, piti, rapture. And here the rapturous feeling becomes very strong. And that will condition next factor enlightenment called pasaddi. Pasaddi is a tranquility, the feeling of lightness. And that pasaddi condition the next factor of enlightenment called samadhi. And this samadhi is not the jhana samadhi. It is the vipassana samadhi. It is the concentration of insight. The concentration that develops when the mind observes rising falling phenomena. And with that, when the samatha vipassana, the samathas, the vipassana samadhi develops, then that will lead to the next factor, the seventh factor of enlightenment, which is upekka. And if we keep our attention, we maintain our mind in that state of upekka for a longer period of time, from upekka, naturally, the mind will enter a state of void. And that is the experience of Nibbana Dhatu. That is how Nibbana is experienced through the seven factors of enlightenment. Yeah. And once one begins to get a glimpse, at least a glimpse of Nibbana, then, then naturally one begins to see, begins to really 
understand and realize what the Four Noble Truths are. That is the fifth aspect of the Dharma, Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths, the first Noble Truth speaks of Dukkha. Now, what is Dukkha? The Buddha explained, first Buddha explained Dukkha in terms of uh, the physical causes conditioned by the body, such as birth, old age, decay, sickness, and death. Then the Buddha goes on to explain about the suffering, the unsatisfactoriness that's conditioned by the mind, such as association with people or conditions that are not pleasant, not favorable, and then having to separate from people whom you love, things that you like, pleasant conditions you have to be separated from, that's also dukkha. And unfulfilled desires and uh, wishing for something, desiring for something that you cannot get. That's also, these are mental aspects of dukkha. After explaining dukkha at the physical and then the mental level, then the Buddha summarizes the meaning of dukkha in these words. Buddha said, Sankitena Panchupadana Khanda Dukkha. In short, in summary, that the five grasping aggregates are dukkha. Now, this in this statement lies the most profound meaning of the word dukkha, which ordinary people cannot understand so easily. Only those practitioners, after they have developed and begin to understand when the five mental hindrances are kept under control, then the mind becomes clearer, then begin to see these five aggregates. Mental hindrances, then the five aggregates. Five aggregates. When one sees and familiarizes oneself with five aggregates, that is the understanding and realization of Dukkha. Yeah. One sees the grasping of the aggregates. That grasping aggregates is Dukkha. Yeah. So, in the process of developing mindfulness and the Dhamma, we will naturally be developing the skills of Vipassana. And Vipassana involves the training of the mind to see all phenomena in terms of anicca, impermanence, dukkha, unsatisfactoriness, and anatta, non-self. Now, in the training of Vipassana, there are certain knowledge or insights that are very important. They are called Vipassana jnana. The first First, Vipassana jnana refers to Nama Rupa Parichida jnana. That is, we have to clearly distinguish between mental and physical phenomena. And how is this done? That is what walking meditation becomes so important. When you walk, when your mind is very clear, and there's no distraction, not easily distracted, then you will be able to see when your body starts to move, there is an intention. And that intention is a mental phenomenon. Then your leg starts to move. That leg movement, that body movement, is a physical phenomenon. So we begin to see there is intention and there is the body movement. The intention is Nama, the movement is Rupa. And while walking, there may be some sound, birds chirping or some 
wind blowing, and all these things we observe it as Nama Rupa. The sound is form, physical phenomena. The hearing of it, the knowing of the sound, perception of the sound, what sort of sound it is, bird sound or whatever sound, that is mind. That's a phenomenon of mind. Yeah. But the sound itself is the vibration, the physical vibration. That is physical phenomena. So when we are able to clearly distinguish this, Nama Rupa, that's what it's called Parichita Jnana, clearly distinguish mental and physical phenomena. But here we must remember the whole practice of Vipassana is to see impermanence and dukkha and to see the non-self. So this Nama Rupa is actually we the five aggregates, with, with regards to the five aggregates, analyze these five aggregates in terms of Nama Rupa, mind body. And then see how, once we are able to see clearly the distinction between Nama Rupa, then that will lead on to the next Vipassana Jnana. It is called Hetu Pacheya Jnana. In practice, Again, when we are walking, we observe the intention. We see it, the intention as a cause and the movement as an effect. So every time we move, we see there's intention, cause, the movement, effect. And if a sound arises, then the sound is a cause, the hearing is an effect. If we win, the wind blows. The wind is a cause, the feeling, the cool sensation, that's an effect. So we see everything in terms of cause and effect. When we are able to see this phenomena, cause and effect very clearly, this is what is called Hetu Pache Jnana, the insight with regards to cause effect. And this insight will naturally lead on to the next insight. It is called Udaya Vyanyana. Udaya Vyanyana is the knowledge of rising, falling. And this leads to the experience of change or impermanence. It is the experiential knowledge. Although all of us understand when we talk about change or impermanence, we all understand. But that understanding is at the conceptual level. This conceptual level need to be translated to experiential knowledge. So this is where when we develop this Vipassana Jnana, then we begin to experience it rising, falling. We see everything in terms of just rising, falling phenomena. At first, we may see something that arises and then ceases. But when the mind becomes sharper and sharper, we see rising, falling, not in two moments. It is just in one moment, rising, falling, rising, falling. And that's where the mind experiences Sanitya. And when you experience Sanitya, Impermanence is the true, true nature of things. When we understand truth, naturally it will be accompanied by a sense of bliss. And that's why there will be great bliss and joy that will arise. Yeah. Then, sometimes there will also be, for some people who do not have much knowledge of the Dhamma, some fear may arise. It is bhaya jnana. It is actually the fear of losing the self. But those who have already got a good grounding understanding of dhamma, the theory, then they will have not have this problem, fear. So it is upon developing these insights that we will be able to effectively cultivate 
the seven factors of enlightenment, as I mentioned just now. What happened is this. When the Vipassana jnana develops, when we are able to see rising falling phenomena and we have, we see very clearly and experience it for ourselves and the joy, the bliss that arise. Yeah? And that is how we break the fatta. There are 10 fatas that binds us to this samsaric existence. The first fatta is the fatta of Sakaya Ditte. Sakaya Ditte refers to the self delusion, the deluded idea that there is a person, there is a being within this body, there is an entity. So, it is that experience that when Sakaya Ditte, we are able to break to Sakaya Ditte, that is self delusion. Then what happens is this, the other factors also, we begin to break that factor of uh, uh, our doubts, our doubts with regards to Dhamma, any doubts with regards to practice will automatically be dissolved. Our confidence, it will be an unshakable confidence in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. And then the factor of Silabhata Paramasa, any wrongful rites and rituals, unnecessary rites and rituals, all that we will realize it is not useful any longer. So when the three, when these three factors, first three factors are broken, that is what we say we enter, one enters the stream, the stream of Nibbana or stream winner or stream enterer. That means that within seven lifetimes at the most, one will experience one's final liberation. So these insight knowledges are very important when we are properly guided and uh, we are able to realize this, it will, as I mentioned, effectively convert our conceptual understanding of the Dhamma into experiential knowledge. Yeah. There's no amount of book knowledge, whatever Dhamma that we listen. And uh, if we do not put them into practice and realize, we cannot get this experiential knowledge. Once you get this experiential knowledge, that is how we will be able to transform. One transform from an ordinary human being, that is putujana, into a noble Arya Pugala. Arya Pugala and refers to noble, noble being. A noble being that is a noble one or worthy one that is uh, becomes a harmless being. Harmless being means one who, when the tendencies of loba, dosa, moha, greed, hatred, delusion, and becomes what you call, uh, when distant, distant away from greed, hatred, delusion, then one becomes more and more harmless being. That's a noble being, yeah? And uh, does not harm oneself does not harm others. So in order, now in order to go beyond the samsaric cycle, right, the cycle of birth and death, we need to understand the teachings of what you call paticca samuppada or dependent origination. This is a very big subject, paticca samuppada. Actually, this is what the Buddha realized on the night of his enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. Yeah. First knowledge Buddha had under the Bodhi tree on the night of his enlightenment was Buddha was able to see his past lives. And then he was able to see how beings die and are reborn according to their karma. And then 
The third knowledge that arose was this insight. Patija Samuppada, he saw how suffering arises and how suffering ceases. And this teaching, what the Buddha realized on the night of his enlightenment, the Buddha actually taught, simplified it in a simplified version as what is called the Four Noble Truths, where he taught the first sermon, Dhamma Chakapavatana Sutta in Sarnath. And this Patija Samapada, dependent ordination, actually and comes to us and uh, in the form of a formula, a formula when we recite avijja pacha sankara, sankara pacha vinyana, vinyana pacha namarupa, and so on. There are 12 links. There are 12 links. And there are two cycles. One is the anuloma, that is the forward cycle, which explains, which is the bhava chakra, which explains how suffering arises in this world. And then we recite the patiloma, the reverse order. The reverse order tells us how suffering ceases. So, paticca samuppada or dependent origination clearly explains how suffering arises and how suffering ceases. Yeah. It also explains how suffering arises in this lifetime, as well as from life to life, from past life to this life, and to this life to future life, how suffering continues. Yeah. So through the cultivation of the four foundations of mindfulness and the training of Samatha Vipassana, actually Samatha Vipassana involves the cultivation of the four foundations of mindfulness. Then the development of jnana, higher knowledges. Yeah? And this will effectively lead our mind to the practice of what you call silencing, silencing of the mind. Now, what is this silencing of the mind? After we have trained the mind, after we have realized a certain degree of impermanence, then when we sit, any thoughts that arises in the mind, we just have to note that it is impermanent and the thoughts will cease. The thoughts will dissolve itself because the realization of impermanence is already there. If somebody who has not cultivated this mindfulness and not realized impermanence, when thoughts arises, distraction arises, they can go on noting, thinking, 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 the thoughts will not disappear. It will not dissolve. But when wisdom has already developed, when we have already have the wisdom to see impermanence, then when the thoughts arises, we just look at the thoughts, we just see it, we know it is impermanent, it will dissolve. If it doesn't dissolve, then we use the technique of the five men aggregates. We analyze these thoughts into the five aggregates, form, feeling, perception, mental formation, consciousness, and then it will dissolve. Then the gap, the interval between thoughts will become longer and longer. That interval between thoughts, that is the silent moment. That is the peace that we experience. And as it becomes longer and longer, more and more, we develop what you call silence, the silencing of the mind with awareness. Then we develop that mindful, the what you call silencing, we silence our mind to the extent that eventually it will break the habit pattern of a mind to create thoughts. And how is it done is this, in the process of silencing the mind, the mind becomes very sharp. And that sharpness of mind enables us to cut through the links of dependent origination, especially 
at the point of contact and feeling. Now, as mentioned before, the formula says like this, avijja pachaya sankara, sankara pacha vinyana, vinyana pacha nama rupa, nama rupa pacha salayatana, salayatana pacha passo, passa pacha vedana, vedana pacha tanha, and so on. Now, avijja is ignorance. As long as we have ignorance, there's bound to be all sorts of thoughts, volitionary activities. Even at the worldly level. And uh, when a student, mathematics students do some, what you call, try to solve a problem, and if he or she forgets the formula, then there will be all sorts of thoughts, trying this way and that way, trial and error. In the same manner, when we have some problem and we cannot solve that problem, then we have all sorts of thoughts that will arise in our mind. And we will tend to blame all sorts of everything around us. This is how, it's, how that's how we have to understand how avijja, because of ignorance, ignorance will condition sankara, all sorts of what you call volitionary activities. And that sankara will condition vinyana. Vinyana is a consciousness or mind consciousness. Yeah. Here in this life itself, it is this mind consciousness, vinyana. Not only that, we have eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and a mind consciousness. But in the, when one about to pass away, then there is what you call relinking consciousness, patisandhi vinyana. That relinking consciousness condition the sufferings from the past life to the current, to the present life. That's patisandhi vinyana. Yeah. So when vinyana, that is how Paticca Samapada explains how suffering arises in this lifetime as well as how from the past life to this life and this life to hereafter. Now, when we silent the mind, we will have the ability. What happens is there will be less and less thoughts. We break the habit pattern of the mind to create thoughts. When we break the habit pattern of mind to create thoughts, we can see, we can hear, we can smell, we can feel, we can think, but the mind, there's no longer distractions. And that is how we will effectively reduce and eventually be able to overcome craving and attachment. Where there's craving, attachment, there's bound to be aversion, anger. And these are conditioned by delusion factor. Yeah. So the silencing of mind will eventually break our habit pattern to create thoughts. And that's how we can overcome craving, putting an end to the cycle of birth and death. Now, what is craving about? Craving is a force. It is a force that drives us to get what we want. And when we get what we want, we naturally want more and more. And that is how attachment develops. Now we are not aware because we are not aware that by fulfilling our desire, by giving in to our desire, what we are doing is we are adding more fuel to that fire of craving, the fire of desire. That is how the craving becomes stronger and stronger. This is what delusion is about. When we use the word delusion or ignorance, we are not talking about ignorance of anything, everything under the sun. When we use the word delusion, we are not talking about mental disorder or something in the psychological context. 
we are talking about not able, not being able to see the true nature of self, the true nature of this life and the true nature of things around us, the impermanence, the unsatisfactoriness and the nature of non-self. Yeah. So, and uh, now, those who understand this path of liberation, those who understand going through the four foundations of mindfulness, and of course, as we develop, we also begin to see how Patija Samupada dependent origination interacts. And when we are able to see this, this is how we are able to choose. One is able to choose either the path of the Arahant by putting an end to samsaric cycle of birth and death, or to choose the path which the Buddha took, the Bodhisattva path, and uh, to attain to perfect enlightenment by developing all the necessary knowledge and skills to enlighten others by considering that all sentient beings as their own parents, as their own mothers and fathers, and which that is what the Buddha mentioned. Buddha mentioned that it is difficult to find someone who has not been a mother or father to one another in this long samsaric cycle of birth and death. Now, what is most important is, is actually your aspiration. The aspiration that you have is very important. If you choose to walk the Arahat path, then you must make the wish that all the merits you have done in this lifetime and all the merits you have done in the past, may all this merit become a cause and a support for your final liberation. If, however, if you choose the Bodhisattva path, then you should always renew your Bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is the vow that you make to gain enlightenment for the sake of others, for the sake of all your parents sentient beings. So if your aspiration of vow, it is actually your aspiration and vow that will provide you with the right motivation to practice the Dhamma, to gain enlightenment. And it is also that aspiration will give you the strength, will give you the courage to overcome whatever illness, whatever obstacles that you go through in the process of your practice of Dharma. Because your intention your motivation, the right motivation is so very important. Yeah. So whichever path you choose, you need to remember the final words of the Buddha. What did the Buddha say? Buddha said, Vaya Dhamma Sankara Appama Dena Sampadeta. Buddha said this. Transient are all component things. Work out your deliverance with heedfulness or mindfulness. So this is the way how we can overcome birth and death through mindfulness. So may the blessings of the Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, be with all of you always. So wish you all have good health, peace, happiness, and may all the blessings be with you so that you have good health. We often say this in our blessings. We say that Abhiwadana Silisa Nichangwada Pacha, you know, Jataru Dhamma Vadanti. Are you one no sukambalam? We say 
And when one who is respectful and always in the habit of respecting Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha, four things will increase. That is, are you means lifespan, are you? And what is this lifespan for? What is this long life for? Actually, so many people pray for long life, but they don't really understand what this life is for. So they pray for long life in order to see their children get married, that they will have grandchildren, and so on. And sometimes they pray to have long life so that they can fulfill their various selfish dreams. Actually, what people do not realize is this. The life of a human, being born as a human being, it is so precious. A human being has the unique ability, potential, to develop the mind to gain liberation. That is what in Pali Sanskrit, manas usanata. Manas refers to the mind. Usanata is elevated state or developed state. Mind that is developed, mind that has been, that has been elevated. That's what a human being is. So, if we can develop what our life, long life, is actually for us to go through, having seen, having seen the impermanent nature, the enjoyment that we have in our life, all the sensual enjoyment, then we begin to see how impermanent, how transient they are. That's where we must make a turning point to make the wish, the aspiration, to walk the Dhamma's path, to go beyond this worldly existence. Yeah. So that aspiration is very important. Yeah. And uh, that's what long life is for. And of course, as we live longer, naturally there will be a lot more pain all sorts of sicknesses and all sorts of uh, challenges that we have to meet. But if we have the right aspiration, the right motivation, then we see that all this suffering, this pain that we are going through, it actually, we see it in terms of karmic clearing. That means something which we have done in the past, we, the, sufferings that we have inflicted on others. Now it begins to ripen and we are not able to distract ourselves because of our failing senses, sense organs. So we begin to see the suffering, the impermanent nature of things. And if we have the faith, if we have the confidence in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha and we have the right motivation, we'll be able to see all these phenomena just come and go, rising, falling, watch feeling as feeling, then everything will come, it rise and fall. So in our old age, we can see impermanence much clearer. And when we have the pain, when we have whatever sufferings that we have, the memories that we have, we see all these phenomena, they rise and fall. That is how we develop wisdom. And it is so important for us to grow as we age, to age with wisdom. And so may you all have long life and good health and so that you can continue to walk the Dhamma's path and realize the final goal. Nibbana. So, wish you all sadhu sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu sadhu. To the, what you call uh, Vishwa Nekatan for hosting this uh, session. Yeah. And uh, 
Remember Vish, uh, Vishwa Nekatan International uh, Peace Center, yeah? The real peace is actually not just the absence of war. The real peace is the peace within our minds, our hearts. Yeah, Dr. Ari there? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, most venerable uh, Pante Mahinder. Uh, we are very grateful to you for accepting our invitation, extended to you virtually, and delivering this insightful Dhamma sermon also virtually as the maiden live program via Vishwaniketan YouTube channel. Much merit to you, Terwan Saranai. Please uh, convey my best wishes and, uh, and all the blessings to Dr. Hari, yeah, and uh, all your other family members and uh, the Dhamma families of uh, Vishwa Nikatan and uh, Sadhu Deshmadana. Sadhu to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.